Welcome to this new thinking for a new world podcast of the Talberg Foundation. Can the existing international institutions tackle the climate crisis? Does the European Union have the vision and leadership required to play its role? And what about the United Nations? In the lead up to the Paris Climate Accords, the US, China and the EU had a shared understanding of their fundamental interests. Will this institute be able to facilitate a renewed common understanding? Or do we need to start looking for a new global architecture? Mons Lukatoft, a Danish politician and former president of the United Nations General Assembly, discusses these and other questions with Alan Stoga, the chairman of the Talberg Foundation. Mogens, you have great experience at the global, European, and national levels, so there is much to discuss today. Climate, Europe, democracy. Let me start with an observation and then a question. The observation is that in the face of the coronavirus, the industrial democracies have mobilized an amazing amount of political will, political authority, and massive resources. In Europe and North America, something on the order of $10 trillion, 10 trillion euros, one third of GDP. The question is this, how can at least some of that be refocused on what seems to be an even more dangerous adversary, accelerating climate change? Well, I think two things are extremely important in the aftermath of the coronavirus, when we hopefully soon as a kind of control of that phenomenon. One thing is that we are willing, understanding that we should continue for quite a long time with a very strong financial expansion in order to overcome the fears and hesitations among companies and citizens to consume and invest. And that we organize that stimulus in a way where we're promoting the green transformation of the economies as well. Because uh, otherwise, this will mean that we are setting on pause the very, very, very important efforts to try to avoid an even bigger catastrophe in the future, a more slow-going, even more evil catastrophe of climate change for, for the next generation. So this is a very big threat for the green development, but it's also an opportunity. There seems to be consensus in Washington, in Berlin, in Brussels, in Paris, that spending huge resources is necessary. The question now seems to be, how do we avoid business as usual in the allocation and distribution of those resources? And at the same time, how do we balance that with democratic choices in Denmark, in Europe, in the United States, and globally? In other words, the problem doesn't seem to be money. The problem seems to be how to get people to spend it in ways that, as you just suggested, not only keep the economy going, but contribute to the greening of the economies. Yeah, I don't think that is very clear. If that's possible, uh, I'm afraid there will be problems both for kind of all too early return for many people to a neoliberal uh, attitude that the market forces can do it all alone, but that would be very, very dangerous. I mean, people are not spending a lot of money in, in the coming couple of years because they are not sure about employment, they're not sure about the future, and they're afraid of their pension funds being less valuable and so on. So it's very important that first, of course, the willingness to spend in spite of the uh, amount of debt piling up, but also put conditionality on the money spent, that we pri give priority to the public investments in all the necessary changes in infrastructure, in energy, in transportation systems, and so on, that can support the green transformation, investment in research and development, in, in cooperation with the companies in this field. So it's quite fundamentally changed puzzle in economic policy if we should be able to do this. And of course, it takes 
a lot of international and in particularly seen from my point uh, of view, European cooperation. And the question here is, well, Europe has not been that good to cooperate in the initial phase of the coronavirus. There have been uh, a lot of problems in the recent past connected to Brexit, connected to Eastern Europe, uh, authoritarian developments there, connected to the uh, lack of unity in the past month about the corona bonds and common sharing of risk uh, in the investment in fighting the corona. So Europe has a lot of steps to go to act in the right way. And I'm afraid, actually, I'm very much afraid that if Mrs. Merkel doesn't take a much softer and more accommodating approach to France, Italy, Spain after this. And if the Dutch don't join her, uh, that could be ultimately the end of the European Union as we can know it today. You have said in earlier conversations that you, in fact, think the creation and nurturing of the European Union over the last many decades is one of the great accomplishments, not just to the 20th century, but indeed in the long sweep of civilization. You've just articulated your fear that at this moment of crisis, Europe may not continue or the European Union may not continue. Besides hoping that Mrs. Merkel gets up on the right side of bed in the next weeks, what can be done to try to help other Europeans, other actors conserve and nurture this amazing institution of the European Union? Well, I think the more forthcoming attitude uh, also, not only in this very moment, but in the, the couple of years to come from, from the German and Dutch side and Northern Europe in general, will be crucial to avoid a change of sentiment and the change of public voting in Southern Europe that could break the European Union. I mean, the risk in Italy is very obvious that Mr. Salvini will be able to mobilize a really anti-European attitude from the side of Italy. That could be corresponding trends in France, even if I, I have no doubt about the possibility of Mrs. Uh, Le Pen winning a French election. It's not impossible if European solidarity is not strengthened. Of course, we know that the problem is, are there the leadership in Germany to convince the German voters that they should not react the other way around if solidarity is shown, that they should vote for alternative for Deutschland or things like that. But I think Germany can do it. And I think a strong leadership in Germany can convince the German public that it is in Germany's evident self-interest to get European up, Europe up and running again, because the German economy will be uh, hurt, the German banks will be hurt in a catastrophic way if Europe breaks down. That raises, I think, the obvious question, not why the leaders aren't leading, but why the citizens, presumably of Northern Europe, of the Netherlands, of Germany, of other countries, aren't demanding more Europe. They don't seem to be. So do we have a democratic problem here, small d? Well, I think at least we have an aftermath of a number of problems that have not been solved in a convincing way through European cooperation, which has, of course, discredited the European cooperation. Zone. I mean, the whole aftermath of the financial crisis, the austerity policies that has been maintained up till now, uh, has been the reason for a lot of people, especially low-paid people, people feeling insecurity socially and economically, that the European Union did not work for them. That those who were sparing the bulk of the unemployment and social insecurity were those who paid the bill for the financial crisis created by quite other forces of, uh, in, in the banking and financial sector. Uh, speculations and so on. So this this mistrust of the political system in each and every country, but in Europe, as the economic policy has been defined through the stability pact in Europe, has 
been eroding some of the understanding I about what Europe is. But of course, the handling of the migration crisis uh, has also contributed to, to, to that. So Europe has big problems, and it's very, very important that the leaders understand the, uh, the simple necessity of acting more in solidarity in order to overcome the present crisis, the corona crisis. Let me circle back to the CO2 tax that you mentioned, because in your argument going forward, that tax is critical. What are the odds, do you think, in practical political terms, that the major countries in Europe will move on this individually and move fast? Or what is the chance that through some miracle, a European-wide CO2 tax could be agreed and implemented relatively quickly? What we will see is a kind of combination that there will be some kind of gradually increased European common CO2 taxation, but also that some countries, hopefully my own uh, country, Denmark, also will uh, walk forward even quicker in order to exploit the possibility of coming also industrially in the forefront of providing the solutions, the products, the technology uh, the whole world will need in a few years' time. Uh, but, but what we have to work with both on the European level and on the national levels is that, uh, the understanding that a green, sustainable, climate-friendly uh, change can be exploited as a, a weapon to create jobs, create more new competitive, long-lasting jobs than those we have already. But the very, very important detail here is that will only be accepted among the business community and in the general public if we at the same time are willing to invest in people's and companies' ability to make the change. It's not only that we have to have this CO2 emission tax on the top of it gradually increasing, but it's also that we uh, put in the necessary resources to re-educate people so they can take up new jobs where old jobs will disappear and support those companies who could be tending to leak, to leave the country, which are going forward most rapidly or the part of the world going forward most rapidly. Uh, and 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 be be black producing companies elsewhere instead of staying and changing to green companies, and that will take uh, resources to support those uh, uh, companies in in their change, so that they can gradually uh, come up with the new solutions without going out of business. So we we had to understand the more necessary is it that we support the uh, transition and cover some of the transition costs both for the companies and for for the ordinary people that has to to take up new qualifications. Uh, so demands strong societies willing to spend in a structurally uh, right way in in the in their efforts to recover from the corona crisis. I think that is clearly true. My deepest concern, but I suspect you share this, is the apparent lack of urgency in the face of a truly urgent challenge. On the one hand, coronavirus was something we knew nothing about just a few months ago, but have mobilized all of this effort very quickly. On the other hand, we've known of the climate challenge for decades, and indeed, now we are in the midst of a decade where we have to cut emissions in half by 2030 in order to sustain a livable planet. Yet, as I look around, I see almost zero energy. I, th I think you're not quite right in the pessimism about the European Commission, at least. I mean, Mr. Timmermans is, is very much in the forefront in calling for this kind of Green Deal, uh, also combining that with the uh, restoration of the economy and the jobs right now. And of course, it will take the major countries' uh, participation, not at least Germany, also on this and France. I think in my country, the understanding is there 
Uh, we saw in the last general election less than a year ago an extremely high priority among the electorate to do climate action. And we have a government who has committed to reduce the CO2 emissions by 70% before 2030. I think also they are just now trying to work out how can we combine the necessary stimulus with the fulfillment of that goal of CO2 emissions. But of course, we also have to hope for one, of course, the change in America in the government of the United States next year, because without a full-size American participation, this would be very difficult to reach. But we also have, and that's my experience from my time as president of the General Assembly when we had the Sustainable Development Goals of the Climate Agreement, this will only happen when we come back to the situation we had in 2015, where the American and the Chinese leaderships are aware that they have more common interests, more common challenges than they have opposing interests. China, I think, understands that better than at least the leadership in the United States right now. And I think one of the disturbing facts about the corona situation right now is that we are building up new animosities between the West and China. We have opposing interests in many issues, but in the most uh, fundamental issues, we have exactly the same interests and we need to cooperate. It will be a very bad idea in itself if the struggle for finding the right solutions for climate change will be divided into opposing and uh, protected areas of the economy, not engaging with each other, one led by the US and one led by China. I want to pick up that thread of the United Nations and the global infrastructure, because arguably global cooperation in the face of the pandemic has been, to be polite, thin. The United Nations has not played an important role outside the WHO and their efforts. Uh, the Security Council has literally been silent. What role could the UN play and how could we get them to play it if you were in your old job again? The United Nations will never be stronger than the major member states will allow them to be. What was successful in 2015, for the last time in recent history, was that US and China realized their common interests were more important than their uh, divergent interests. And that Europe at that point was still somewhat more united. No Brexit had happened. And, uh, there was also an increasing engagement around the, the green agenda, the uh, climate agenda in Europe. And what I think the uh, basic understanding I got uh, confirmed when I was in the United Nations is that without the participation of the US, of China and the European Union, we will not be able to solve any of the global crises we are facing. And what, what's going in the very much wrong direction for the United Nations right now, of course, is the uh, bashing of all kind of UN institutions from the President of the United States uh, in the last round, the uh, withdrawing of, of funds from, from the uh, World Health Organization, which is very damaging and very stupid. I wouldn't be able to do a lot with those attitudes we are having right now. Europe must get its acts together. That could happen. I hope so. I tend to think so. China should be brought back in a more constructive cooperation. Not that much China bashing, but also a demand, of course, of China to respect more the international rules and the U.S. The, the voters of the U.S. will have to take a totally different attitude. This time around, if we should be able to solve any of the basic challenges we are facing, which uh, could be the climate, could be health, could be inequality, could be the enormous problems that you just touched on it, we are facing when the coronavirus will spread around in the poor countries of this world. and. Even if we are successful in the first round, through that route, come back to us if we don't support them in suppressing 
this virus. I mean, all problems are global in their character. No one can imagine thinking really about it, that we can be able to, to solve any of these problems without a, a renewed, a stronger international cooperation. That can be kind of a depressing conclusion because it seems to be difficult, but, but I will never give up hope here. And I think that really is perhaps the right place to start. If we were talking not in 2020, but in 1947, 1946, looking at a devastated Europe, a devastated Asia, uh, an economy that, uh, especially with the withdrawal of wartime spending, looked headed right back to a Great Depression. We might have said, absent enormous global leadership, this is the end. And that was before climate, it was before pandemic, it was before some of these other issues. But those leaders back in San Francisco uh, in 1948 were able to carve a new infrastructure, a new architecture. And I guess that is where I'd like to leave you with the final question. Are we at a moment where just hoping what has worked can work again, or at a moment where we really need to be thinking about new architecture, even if we don't know who the architects might be? I don't know that exactly, but, but, but what you could hope for is it took a long time to understand what was necessary to fight the Great Depression in 1929 onwards. But finally, Roosevelt came in and it began to happen. And what we learned from the Great Depression and what we learned from what happened already after World War I was there had to be a new, much more state interventionist, financial expansionist policy in order to avoid uh, deep depressions. We forgot that after the financial crisis in 2008. And maybe the bad experiences we had from that also impacting uh, somewhat disruptive development in Europe has learned the leaders of today and tomorrow that we had to do it differently. And we had to go back, actually, to, to the experiences from 1933 onwards in America in order to deal with this. But, but the, the new agenda, of course, is not only employment. It's structuring the efforts to recreate employment so that it can be not even avoiding a stand still in the green efforts, but be the voter for the green efforts. States will have to use much more money in the, the coming one, two, three, four, four years than they get in. States will have to pile debt. It's very, very important that it happens in the field where we actually promote the green development and get the support and the understanding of companies and citizens that, that they should use their money in that direction and that will be the most profitable, uh, profitable for them all. This is a structure we need to build. And I really think we have a good chance doing it. It's by no means sure it will happen, but it's quite sure that if it doesn't happen, we will not have the time to overcome the next more gradually uh, exploding, but much deeper catastrophe, which is climate change. Uh, of uh, up to three, four degrees Celsius over the pre-industrial age with all uh, the uh, changes in living conditions for human beings and animals and plants and whole civilizations that will be the result of that happening. Thank you very much. Uh, I like your optimism. We need to translate your experience as a statesman and a leader uh, into action. Hopefully, we can get some people starting to move. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. To me. Thank you for listening. Please check talbergfoundation.org for more podcasts, videos, and articles. And follow us on social media to stay tuned to upcoming events. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.